Coming to you now is Lahem Panim with your host, Pastor Cameron Urie, Senior Pastor and Bible Teacher at Renton Park Chapel in Renton, Washington. Hello and welcome to Lahem Panim. I hope all of you had a good Christmas this past week. I don't know where you're listening from today, but let me tell you, it has definitely been cold here in the Seattle area. Particularly this past Wednesday, I remember I went outside to warm up my wife's car before she left for work, and I found ice all over both our windshields. And knowing that she wouldn't be able to see, I went ahead and got the defrosters going. But not wanting to open the gate while the car was going, I waited until she began pulling out of the driveway before I attempted to unlock the gate. And she was running a little bit late for work, and so I was anxious to get the gate open as quickly as possible. However, to my dismay, I found that the lock was frozen. And I remember I couldn't even get the key into the keyhole. I kept pushing and pushing, but it simply would not go in. Now, after a great deal of effort, I finally managed to knock that key into the lock, and after much more effort, to twist it enough to where I could get it off the gate. And she was able to leave. But you know, it made me think. I couldn't open the gate because the lock was frozen. And it was frozen because the world, or at least my world, was touched by a bitterly cold frost. You know, it's interesting how C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Chronicles of Narnia, he describes the sin-enslaved land of Narnia in terms of winter. It is bitterly cold in Narnia, under the spell of the White Witch. And as Lewis says through one of his main characters, it's always winter, but never Christmas. And it's not until Aslan, the great lion, representative of the Lion of Judah, Jesus, it's not until he comes that the world begins to thaw and come back to life. And you know, in a similar way, our world was frozen until Jesus came. The warmth of that quiet stable in Bethlehem, it marked the beginning of the thawing of the world. And it's through Jesus that the lock to the gate of heaven has been made unfrozen and opened. Not by a merely human hand, but by a human hand that was, at the same time, the very hand of God. A person who was, at the same time, both God and man. That's what we needed in order to break the power of sin and death. The Son of God in the person of Jesus Christ. It is through him that the defroster was set on the world. As through him, we are enabled to be united again with the sin-melting, holy-making, love-creating presence of God. And it is this person that Peter and John are seeking to connect the crowd with here in Acts chapter 3. They have just healed a lame beggar, and so Peter is explaining to the crowd how this beggar was healed by the very name of Jesus, the one they had crucified. And Peter tells them, point blank, that they committed the greatest crime in human history. They killed the Son of God. And before salvation could be offered, they first had to come to terms with that reality, with an understanding of both who Jesus is and what they had done to him. Now, at this point, Peter begins to use a softer tone with his audience. He tells them that he understands that they, and the Jewish leaders, killed Jesus out of ignorance. He says in verse 17, And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. And you know, this ignorance, it's key because in the Old Testament law, there was a difference between deliberate sins and sins of ignorance. The person who sinned presumptuously was a rebel against God and was guilty of great sin. And he was to be cut off from his people, which could mean excommunication and even death. The defiant, high-handed sinner was condemned. But the person who sinned unwittingly and without deliberate intent was given the opportunity to repent and seek God's forgiveness. Now, 
Ignorance does not remove the sinner's guilt, but it does mitigate the circumstances. Remember, Jesus had prayed from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And God had answered that prayer. Instead of sending judgment, he sent the Holy Spirit to empower his church and to convict lost sinners. Now, Peter continues. He says, But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. And so Peter, he encourages them by telling them how all of this was foretold by God through the prophets and was a part of his divine plan for the salvation of the world. And then he says in verse 19, Repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. Now, I'm the dad of two amazing kids. I'm blessed with both a son and a daughter, both of whom are in school now and both of whom have a considerable amount of homework. And every time my wife and I sit down with them to help them, there are two things that we need personally. The first is patience, which I confess I'm not always the best at. And the second is an eraser. We use a lot of erasers at my house. We have big erasers for big mistakes and little erasers for little mistakes. But you know, none of them work perfectly. No matter how hard you scrub, most of the time you can still see where that mistake was and can oftentimes even read what was written there. However, not so with God's eraser. This phrase, blotted out, that Peter uses, it compares forgiveness to the complete wiping away of ink from the surface of a document. And once again, this is Old Testament theology. God had said in Isaiah 43:25, I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. How awesome it is that God, when we confess our sins to him and receive his forgiveness in and through Jesus Christ, we have a clean slate. God remembers our sins no more. And at any moment you are ready to repent, you can have a fresh start with God. Anybody listening today need a fresh start with God today? It's available to you. All we have to do is, as Peter says, repent and turn. And Peter is offering this crowd not only the opportunity of experiencing the overwhelming joy of having the weight of their personal sins removed, But he's also promising to them that they will experience a communal blessing if they corporately turn to faith in Christ. Peter says in verses 20 to 22 that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. Now, Peter is here quoting from Deuteronomy 18, 15. Moses, if you remember, he was revered by the Jews as their first and greatest prophet. And so the Jews viewed the prophet that would be like him to be the Messiah. And Jesus, he really was like Moses in so many ways. Both were born into a Hebrew world under Gentile domination, Egyptian and Roman. Both had unusual cots at birth. You had a basket and a manger. Both were saved from death at the king's order. You had Pharaoh and Herod. Both were raised in the home of one who was not their father, Pharaoh and Joseph. Both had to put up with criticism and persecution from their own people. Both appointed 70 chosen helpers. Both sent out 12 men on special missions. Both experienced 40-day fasts. Both fed multitudes through miraculous means, manna and quail, bread and fish. Both were touched by God so that their faces shone. Both heard God as an audible voice. 
Both acted as mediators of a covenant that was sealed by blood. Both interceded for their people with God. Both delivered their people from bondage. Both performed miracles. Both appeared after their death. You think of Moses appearing in the transfiguration and Jesus later in the resurrection. And so Peter is saying that this is who Jesus is, the second Moses that they had been waiting for. But Peter warns them, saying, And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And once again, Peter is quoting from Deuteronomy 18.19. Peter's audience was in the precarious position of losing covenant blessings because they had rejected the Messiah. And Peter says, And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaimed these days, You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And here, Peter is quoting from Genesis 22.18 and 26.4. Jesus Christ was the ultimate fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant and all the blessings that came with it, which are still available to the Jews. And he concludes once again with the resurrection and what God's purpose was in sending Jesus into the world. He says, God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. And that is the ultimate healing that Jesus offers to us. And it is a healing that comes through faith and repentance. Now, the two go hand in hand. You can't have faith without repentance, and you can't have repentance without faith. It's not enough to believe in Jesus. No, we must, like true disciples, choose to follow him to leave our old lives behind, our self-destructive, crippled, wicked ways. And we need to embrace lives like the beggars that are made entirely new. So I want to encourage you, let us embrace that life today, that life that is made possible in and through Jesus Christ. Let's close in prayer today. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you so much for the mercy and the grace that you continue to show us day by day. And we want to thank you that any moment we choose, we can have a fresh start with you. You can use your holy eraser on us to erase our sins and to wash us white as snow so that we can come into your presence again without shame, knowing that we are covered by your blood and in and through you made right with God. Help us to experience today all the relief of knowing that our sins have truly been forgiven and that you are empowering us to live lives in keeping with repentance. Amen. Today's episode of Lahem Panim has been made possible by Renton Park Chapel, a church that is committed to the ministry of sharing the joy of hearing and doing God's word and to the mission of bringing people into the life-giving presence of Jesus Christ in and through vibrant preaching, teaching, Bible study, prayer, and ministry to a world that is in desperate need of the healing touch of Jesus Christ. If you'd like to learn more about our ministry here at Renton Park Chapel or would like to request any of our messages here on Lahem Panim, you can visit us online at rentonparkchapel.org or lahempanim.org. You can also find us on both Facebook and Twitter. We look forward to hearing from you and thank you for listening. And may you know all the fullness of having in your life the bread of the presence of God.